Hi, my name is Henry Adams Feck, and I'm very excited to read to you from my new book, Life is Like Canadian Football and Other Authentic Folk Songs. This was just published by Invisible Publishing, and the book tells the story of Henry Adams Feck, folk song collector, who discovers in the basement of Library and Archives Canada a box of tapes, which it turns out contain folk songs of Canadian football players. Um, this discovery launches Henry Adams Feck on a quest for authenticity, which he follows um, from London, Ontario to Sackville, New Brunswick, to Dawson City and beyond. I'd like to read to you from a short section called Night Herding Song. Uh, the book contains both song lyrics and prose uh, narrative, and also a lot of footnotes throughout both. Uh, but I'm going to read to you from one of the prose sections, and this is uh, where we learn a little bit about Staunton R. Livingston, the iconoclastic folklorist who Henry believes uh, is responsible for making these recordings in the, in the 60s, uh, late 60s, early 70s. I have dreamt the following scene, which takes place in a locker room at dusk. Players and coaches gone home, save one, a second-string middle linebacker. Still wearing his sweat-salted tank top and grass-stained pants, and obviously exhausted, he sits on a long bench strewn with towels and half-full water bottles, odorous knee pads and jock straps. He diligently tunes a scratched-up guitar while an older man with sideburns and long hair sets up a large condenser microphone, a delicate instrument in its own right. After unspooling the cables and positioning the stand, the phonographer stands back by his reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, propped solidly on a parallel bench, and after a moment of meditation, inspects his informant. The player halts his restless, shaking knee, and then, a song emerges in the key of G. It is about the essential desire of humanity to create both the world and itself. Hence, it is a song about everything that it is possible to sing. And it is beautiful. The vibrations move throughout the cavernous space, swelling and surging, expanding and contracting. Converted into analogous electrical waves by the microphone, the signal sears like an endlessly burning cigarette straight onto the humming tape. By the end of the second refrain, the phonographer has begun, silently, to weep. It remains unclear why Staunton R. Livingston chose to record songs of Canadian football players in the 1970s. The most reasonable explanation I have yet invented centers on the fact that Canadian football is both a modernist and a traditional art. On one hand, the language of industrialized warfare saturates the game in terms of both mechanics and strategy. To list only a few examples, one throws the long bomb, one sends the blitz, the line itself, which must be held or advanced, is referred to as the trenches. The division of labor, including the differentiation between manual and intellectual work, precisely mirrors that of the Fordist factory system. And of course, the muscular players in their shoulder pads and helmets, sprung coils of strength and speed and machinic armor, exactly resemble unique forms of continuity in space by the Italian futurist Umberto Boccioni. On the other hand, the reason the Canadian and American games of football are currently so divergent, despite sharing an identical historical origin point, is that the Canadian games rules were changed more slowly and conservatively in order to preserve the original source of rugby whereas the Americans quickly modified their version to suit advertisers and broadcast corporations. 
Perhaps the Canadian Football League in and of itself appealed to Livingston. Its mashup of present and past, cutting edge and solid root, insofar as we can piece together his taste and disposition. A relevant obstruction within the field of Livingston studies, however, is the fact that after 1966, Stantonar Livingston did not write anything down. This, of course, does not mean that he also refrained from thinking or imparting. He was active in the fields of both ethnomusicology and folklore. Although he was an independent, self-taught folklorist, Livingston presented research at major scholarly conferences between 1967 and 1971. Still, representation of Livingston's philosophy has come to us only through the writings of members of his audiences, the entirety of which has had a vested interest in discounting the integrity, cohesion, and revolutionary power of his ideas. All communication, even communication with oneself, involves the unavoidable distortions of noise. Things get even messier when one's enemies are the ones writing the story. I had not yet fully fleshed out these problematics when I first began to listen to the CFL sessions in the summer of 2008. My internship at Library and Archives Canada had ended in late July, and I was in Toronto, having found a short-term sublet in Little Portugal in order to collect myself before my duties as a teaching assistant recommenced in September. I had managed, before leaving Ottawa, to digitize the entirety of the CFL sessions under the radar of the institution's panoptic supervisory system, so that the evaluation and distribution of the project's cultural value could not be slowed by any bureaucratic plots. So, every morning, as I walked east along co College Street, past the ancient shopkeepers sweeping or watering their stretches of sidewalk, the strong summer sun already beating down, I was thus able to listen through headphones to the folk songs of Canadian football players. And I was falling in love. This is from Life is Like Canadian Football and Other Authentic Folk Songs. It's a lot of fun. I hope you uh, will check it out. It's available through Invisible Publishing, the publisher of the book, edited by Lee Nash. And uh, I believe you can find it anywhere books are sold in Canada.